Good evening, everyone. I'm Margaret Andera, Interim Chief Curator and Curator of Contemporary Art here at the Milwaukee Art Museum, and I am pleased to welcome you to tonight's program with Nate Young. Before I introduce Nate, I want to thank the sponsors who made tonight's presentation possible. The African American Art Alliance, or Quad A as it's better known, um, a support group of the Milwaukee Art Museum, and the Chipstone Foundation. And I know we have members of both organizations in the audience tonight, so thank you. Tonight's program is nearly three years in the making. Back in 2019, a group of museum collectors, including members of Quad A, visited Nate in his studio in Chicago with me and identified one of his sculptures, Votive Offering, as a work of particular interest and one they wanted to help the museum acquire in honor of Quad A's 30th anniversary. And like we did for so many of the group's anniversary acquisitions over those 30 years, the plan was to bring Nate to the museum to give a talk about his work. But by the time Votive Offering was officially acquired by MAM in 2020, COVID was here and in-person events weren't possible. So finally, nearly three years after that studio visit, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Using strategies of conceptualism, Nate Young investigates the nature of identity on an ontological level. His work highlights how meaning embedded in the aesthetic of objects resides within fragile networks and contextual systems. Young's recent ongoing project observes his family lineage detailing the fissures found in his grandmother's stories about his great-grandfather and his horse. Excavating these familial accounts connects his practice to the gaps found in larger, related histories, presenting these connections through drawing, sculpture, and as, in, as immersive installations that utilize sound, absence of light, and found objects to project a narrative void. Young received his MFA from the California Institute of the Arts in 2009 and his BA from Northwestern College in 2004. He attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in 2009 and was invited back as the Dean of the Residency in 2015. That same year, Young exhi exhibited his first solo show with the Monique Maloche Gallery in Chicago. Since then, Young's work has been widely exhibited including at Bridge Projects Los Angeles, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, Dupree Art Gallery in Holland, Michigan, the Front Triennial in Cleveland, the Visual Arts Center in Richmond, Virginia, and the Studio Museum in Harlem. In addition to the Milwaukee Art Museum, his work is in the permanent collections of several institutions, including the DePaul Museum in Chicago, the Fabric Workshop Museum in Philadelphia, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. After Nate finishes his presentation tonight, there will be time for questions, so please hold them until then. And for those of you who haven't yet had a chance to see Nate's work hanging in our galleries, it's not far from the auditorium, right through those doors. So after the conclusion of tonight's um, presentation, please feel free to make your way over there. So please join me in welcoming Nate Young. Um, thank you, Margaret. Um, and I'd also like to thank the African American Acquisition Alliance. Did I get her? Quad eight. Quad eight. <laughs> Quad A. Sorry. I was going to try. Um, and also just uh, in general, thank you. Thank you for having me. I am a big fan of this museum. It's such a cool space, and I am uh, honored to be a part of the collection. I'm going to read uh, tonight from a, a, a collection of several different stories, some of which I wrote, uh, and some of which are excerpts from, from things that I've been reading. Um, but I'm gonna start before I get into the like the sort of meat of the of the lecture that I want to give with the with an excer excerpt from a short story by the writer John Edgar Weidman. Stories 
Stories, graves, empty graves, nothing there. All living and dying in them fake, pretend. Even when someone reading or listening or telling a story, it's empty, empty, no time in it. A person requires time to live and die in. Stories, not time, graves. No entering them or leaving them without time. Nothing to breathe inside a story. Nothing lost or found there. No time, only a story, only words. You pretend as if pretending permits you to enter a story, to leave one place and begin in another. You, you let yourself believe you can create time, your time, as if your time, not a story you make up, as if time, not a word, like other words you make up to tell a story. Once upon a time, as if time ends or begins there with words, as if time waits in stories or is something like them, as if a story contains the breath of life, as if words share time or time listens and reads, as if stories are not grave, where we play with the dead, play dead, as if something words make up of nothing is more than time, time saved and not a story, a moment on Grand Street, not fiction, not a grave, not make-believe time, but time saved, more than time, nothing, not nothing, not merely words, not mere story. Okay, so uh, these images are just gonna scroll, but what I, what I wanna do just so that you know, maybe uh, what's coming at you makes more sense than if I just went through. I want to tell you how this is going to be structured. So I have a, I have some excerpts from a story by the author by the name of Walter Mosley. Uh, the book is called John Woman, and John Woman is a, is a story about a a college professor who who well, I won't tell you too much about it because I think you should read it. It's a really great book, but. And, and I'm not giving anything away by saying that in the beginning, very beginning of the book, he murders somebody, right, Caroline? And, um, and it kind of jumps around from, from different parts of his life. But at the part that I'm looking at, he's a college professor and he teaches this class on um, deconstructionist historical devices. Uh, so I'm gonna read some excerpts from that. I'm also gonna read so, some writing of mine that is about my my grandmother and the stories that she told me about her father, my great grandfather. Then I'm also going to read a story about, um, which is also a story about my great grandfather, but it's a separate story that I heard somewhere else. And then I'm also going to give some information that has to do with the Great Migration, and then also talk about the history of black jockeys. And in order to indicate where I am, I'll tell you before I, you know, when I break from one to the other, I'll let you know. But it's sort of, it's gonna be really choppy and hopefully everything is like up in the air and falls into place and then makes sense, but maybe not. John Woman. I am Associate Professor John Woman, he announced. And this class is Introduction to Deconstructionist Historical Devices. A hand went up in the second row. You will be able to ask questions in a few minutes, he said, and the hand went down. But first, I'd like to explain what will happen and what you might learn and what you cannot learn in this seminar. It is my position that history is an unquestionable certainty, the absolute outcome of incontrovertible string of ontological events. In, his, in hit, it, history reaches all the way back to the origin of the race and beyond through the chaotic unfolding of existence. In our history, our one indisputable history are contained assassinations, inspiration, instinctual urges, friendships, conflicts, the multiplicities of gravity and material, black holes and supernovas, our bodies are formed from the fabric of the universe, and so consequently, 
there is a touch of the divine in each of us. You and I are part and parcel of history, slaves to history, playing out our willing and unwilling roles. And so it has been for every living being, every species on earth, and quite possibly life elsewhere. Grandmother. In 2006, I visited my grandmother in her home. I didn't know it at the time, but this would be the last time that I would see her. She passed away the following year. Coincidentally, it would be the first and the last time that I was able to glean a great deal of the familial history from her. I remember it quite vividly as the memory lives on in my mind. I recall the story. As I recall the story, I also realize the certainty of the uncertainty in the mode of recollection. I sat on the floor in her living room with three shoe boxes full of photographs and other documents. My brother had been rummaging in her basement and found these boxes. I recall sitting on her living room floor. I recall her sitting on the couch. We found the images fascinating. Who were these people? We asked my grandmother, not expecting as much as she would provide. As we went through the images, we realized that there were specific stories for each of these distant relatives. The one I was most interested in was the one that I learned was my great-grandfather, her father. His name, which might not have been his name, a name that he had most likely given himself, a name that was lost, a name that was abandoned, an identity that was imagined and then reimagined. John Woman. Accepting for a moment this position as accurate, it is easy to see that the true understanding of history or any major aspect thereof requires knowledge that is currently beyond human ken. We are like the blind prophets guessing at the nature of an elephant. Only the elephant is in another room situated on the opposite side of the globe, while we still believe the world is flat. John stopped for a moment. He had not planned this lecture. He hardly ever worked from notes or predetermined arguments. Migration. During the Great Migration, over three million Southern Blacks migrated from the Southern states of the nation to the Northern cities. They came looking for a better life, seeking better education. They came seeking a better life for their families and better opportunities. During the years of the Great Migration, many Blacks left the South on our own accord. They made the decision, though they knew that it would cost them their identity and everything that they had known previously. But also during this historic movement, many folks were forced to leave for fear of their lives, for fear of their own safety. The Jim Crow laws in the South were in full effect. Many black women, men, and children left under, lived under constant threat and fear. Their lives and their safety could be jeopardized upon a white whim. John Woman, we cannot comprehend the vastness that is history, the man called woman continued. Our capacity for knowledge is mortal, even if the bodies are defined. We are incapable of knowing with certainty what has happened, while at the same time, we are unable to stop ourselves from wondering why we are here and from where we came. This is the stimulus the, in, the incentive for the study and the belief in history. We, you and I, have been propelled to this moment by nothing less than the conspiracy of eternity. The attempt to understand this scheme is the object of study, like the carrot is the goal of the work-weary mule dragging the plow and imagining something sweet. Those of us who crave the carrot of historical knowledge must be aware that we will never achieve this goal, but that, our, that in our wake, 
we will create something beautiful, fertile, quite possibly terrible. We must, as scholars of impossible study, realize that while history is definite, the human investigation of the past can only be art. The one true deconstructionist art, because the only way to capture the essence of history is to make it up. Black jockeys, little known fact, but until the late 1800s and the early 1900s, the sport of horse racing was dominated by black jockeys. 13 of the 15 riders in the first Kentucky Derby were black. And 15 of the first 28 runnings, uh, sorry, and, and the, the Derby was won by 15 out of the first 28 runnings by black jockeys. At one point, a predominant jockey, jockey was quoted saying, Without the black jockey, there would be no such sport as horse racing. They were the country's first sports superstar. The ring. My great-grandfather was part of a secret society of brotherhood called the Black Freemasons, also known as the Prince Hall Freemason. Around the year 1918, he was arrested along with a group of other young black men in Virginia for allegedly talking back to a white woman, quote. They were taken to a local jail and held for trial. The next morning, when the jailer was patrolling, he spoke with my great-grandfather. As they spoke, the jailer happened to see my great-grandfather's mason ring, and that night, my great-grandfather was awakened suddenly. It was the jailer, and he told him to keep quiet and keep low. He opened the door and led my great-grandfather out of the cell and out of the back door of the jailhouse. The lynch mob was already gathering in front of the courthouse. John Woman. My first lecture is often brief. Later, we may go over time. That said, are there any questions so far? Five or six hands went up. John studied the faces of his students. They seemed engaged. Excuse me, Professor Woman, but uh, it sounds like you're saying that nothing has ever happened in the past and that we can't believe anything we study? Yeah, a brutish young man in the third row uh, chimed in. No to the first part of your question, John said. Quite the opposite. Everything has happened. This much is apparent. So you're right. I'm saying you cannot believe anything that you study because it is necessarily incomplete speculation, albeit sometimes quite convincing speculation. But how can that be? Another woman asked. We know that there was a civil war, that all those people died. Excuse me, but what was that war? Why was that war fought? Over slavery, a student in the front row said. Grandmother. Uh, she told me he was a pillar, a father to the community in the tradition of communal living and raising of families in the motherland as black slaves continued to take roles that were, they, uh, that were not able to be filled by absent mothers, fathers, and extended family. Uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters, fathers, and mothers might not be directly related at all. When the structures needed for psychological st stability are systematically de destroyed, the people rise up. My, my great-grandfather was this man. He was a father to the fatherless and a brother to those in need. He provided home to the homeless and meals to the hungry. If travels, travelers needed respite, he provided. My grandmother boldly proclaimed that he was, that he carry up, that she carried on this tradition, as did her father. I grew up, or as did my father, I grew up with brothers from another mother. I can't tell you how many people had keys to my house growing up. John woman. So, said John, you don't subscribe to the notion that the war was waged over a disagreement concerning economic questions and the Southern state's sovereign right of succession? Well, 
a sweatshirted black student said. Maybe the war had other causes, but they seceded because Lincoln was going to free the slaves. But he said that he wouldn't demand freedom for the slaves, the professor argued, only that new states could not be slaveholder. But they thought he would. I see, the professor said doubtfully. They thought. Let me ask you this. Was there a Holocaust where six million Jews were exterminated? Voices sprouted among the class without identification, and maybe, John thought, without volition. Yes, of course, sure there was. Maybe, uh, well, maybe not that many, one dark-haired girl said. What do you mean, a girl in the second row challenged? We know the number. The records have been counted. John thought of asking her name, but didn't want to slow the interaction. It was a big war. A lot of people got away, and people overreact when they see horrible things. Somebody could say that they saw a thousand bodies when they really saw a couple of hundred. A couple of hundred? What are you, a Nazi? Black jockeys. One of the most famous and successful black jockeys was Isaac Murphy. Murphy was the first jockey to take first place in the Kentucky Derby with back-to-back -back victories in 1990, 1890 and 1891, and the first to win three overall. Jimmy Winkfield, who uh, actually the piece, the vote of offering piece that's in the gallery, uh, there's a text in that piece that's uh, uh, about, a... are they not going? Oh, oh all right, start them over. Um, there's a text in that piece that uh, refers to Jimmy Winkfield and a, a story about him. Um, later completed the same feat, winning back-to-back -back in 1901 and 1902. I didn't know. Sorry. I think I'm... All right, you can see them all again. Uh, but by 1904, black jockeys were virtually non-existent. Banned from the sport by the Jim Crow South, jockeys like Winkfield fled the South for Europe. Winkfield finished his career racing in Russia, France, Germany, and Poland, and retired after over 2,600 victories. No black man has won the Kentucky Derby since. The ring. My father called me and told me that she had passed away and the funeral was scheduled for the same day that I was to interview for a, a position in my graduate studies at CalArts. My father told me that he knew it would be a difficult decision, but that, that I should go to my interview. I should think about the future and that there was nothing that I could do. She was gone and that being at the funeral was not as important as my future and my study. My father's sister lived with my grandmother and my grandmother's death, at my grandmother's death, the relationship between my father and his sister became stressed. and Eventually they stopped talking. She developed some psychological health issues, and to this day is, doesn't leave the house. But she also doesn't really throw anything away. John Woman. I'm just talking about the numbers. Maybe there were only three million dead. It's possible, that's all I'm saying. No, said a male student with a deep commanding voice. There were more than six million killed. They have the names and the Nazi records. The families have remembered them. Following this claim, silence filled the room. And you are? John asked the handsome young man sitting in the center seat in the first row. Justin Brown, he said. He had a tan complexion and a steady and steady gray eyes. I'm a chem major, senior 
and this is an elective course for me. And so, Professor Woman said, after an appreciative silence, we have learned from Justin Brown that the Holocaust really did occur and that the number, approximately six million, is an accurate count. One or two heads nodded. Every eye in the room was on John. What proof has he put forth? The proof is in, Justin Brown began, began. Please, Mr. Brown, allow some of the other students to reply. Grandmother. The photograph that I saw of my great-grandfather shows him standing next to a horse. The son of a former slave charged with keeping the stables, my great-grandfather developed a keen sense for the demeanor of horses and was considered to be a fine horse master. This black man, son of a former slave, owned a horse? I thought to myself and reflected on this for years. John Woman. You know, be, you know, because of your reading of books, allied reports, and I, I, you know what I'm gonna do? Flip through it. Yeah. Um, hold on, let me start back at the beginning of this. John Woman. You know, because of your reading of books, allied reports, and the trials of Nuremberg. You know, because of the state of Israel, and its commitment to Jewish peoples around the world. But, John Woman paused and gazed around the classroom, thought of the blank and tinted window, blank, uh, through the bank of tinted windows that made the, gut, the outer wall. He could see the desert under the cloudless sky. But does that make it true? Does that make it a true history or simply something that many of us believe? I say this to you not because I want to negate your beliefs. Really the opposite is true. I'm teaching this course because history is being rewritten, re-envisioned and re-edited every day, every hour of every day. There are people out there who would like to tell you that there was no Holocaust whatsoever. They write books, give speeches, make arguments, and, and sway especially those people who have no passion for the subject. Deconstructionist history is not a spurious branch of study. Oops. Deconstructionist, deconstructionist history is not a spurious branch of study. It is what every enemy of everything you believe practices, day and night. Who, who killed the two million Cambodians? Hey, this is why I wanted it to play on a loop. <laughs> uh, who killed the two, men in, two million Cambodians and the Argentinian uh, Aborigines? Who was responsible for the slaughter of the Hutu and the Tutsi, Congolese and Somalia? Who profited from the slave routes in the Caribbean, North and South America? Those are things we don't know, Justin Brown said, with disgust in his voice. It's not the same as Nazi Germany. A few mutterings agreed. I know the names of the men who assassinated Julius Caesar, but I can't know the company's extent today that profited from centuries of slavery. The class was silent again. Even Justin Brown seemed a little daunted. The sugar companies, woman said, the rum distilleries, shipping lines, and banks that underwrote thousands of slaving expeditions, the plantation masters, many of whom, whose children today are wealthy landowners. You can't have it both ways, Mr. Brown. You can't pick and choose your way through history, taking what you don't want to believe and re-engaging re the rest, or sorry, relegating the rest to the limbo of ignorance. You must take a stand, commit yourself to the truth while understanding that the ground beneath your feet is nothing more than shifting sand. One day, America may be vilified in the annals of history. We may be seen as an aggressive imperialist nation, but upon the subjugated and domination of the rest of the globe, bent upon the subjugation and domination of the rest of the globe. Our capitalism 
may be as reviled as Hitler's anarchy. And who are we to say which version will make it into history books, into the futuristic vid, vid classes, and most dangerous of all, into the language we speak? Migration. The train was the primary vehicle that carried blacks from the south to the north. My great-grandfather traveled via horse. The ring. I decided to go back to the source years later to retrieve the photograph from that last day I spoke to her. My aunt still resides in the house that my grandmother lived in for almost 40 years. I had to make several trips. Upon arrival, sometimes she would open the door and let me in, and other times she would only open the screen and speak to me through the window of the door. And other times she wouldn't even come to the door at all, though I knew she was home. But I knew those boxes were still there. Over time, I developed enough trust and conversation with her for her to let me in, and what I found in the basement was more than what I had imagined. To date, I have still not found those boxes of photographs. As I mentioned previously, my father's sister has a touch of a condition some might consider hoarding. The basement was filled, I mean, completely filled with stuff. But what I did happen upon was, were some other things and some other boxes my brother hadn't seen the first time we searched. Um, I opened a box and to my amazement found what I suspect is to be my great grandfather's mason ring. Along with the ring, I found some notes and journals that I presume belonged to him. I won't read any of those today, but what I will say is I discovered that my great grandfather did own a horse, the horse in that picture, and did travel on that horse from Robeson County, North Carolina to Ardmore, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. Uh, he left in haste, and he had left in danger. Apparently, this horse was special to him, but when he arrived, he could not keep the horse. There were still people looking for him. So he euthanized the horse, and he buried it in a location that he wanted to keep secret. The most the astonishing discovery I made uh, was old and seemed to be outdated, but it was I was able to place the location of the site of the map on a town outside of Philadelphia. This was the site in which he had buried the horse. Later, at this site, I exhumed the bones of the horse. John Woman. Who remembers that the Vandals were people before they came, became an evil noun? So you don't believe that there was a civil war or a holocaust, Justin Brown asked. My belief, my friend, is that is the right word. Or sorry, belief, my friend, is the right word, John Woman said. Okay. Belief, my friend, is the right word, word, John Woman said. History is only, is always little more than an innuendo, a suggestion that we decide to believe or not. Of course you are right about the list of the dead read aloud day and night in Jerusalem. But in positioning one thing, you call another into question. Where is the list of Americans slaughtered? The Cambodians, Nicaraguans, or Vietnamese? If their names are not registered, then did they really suffer and die? The questions are the ones that, these questions are the ones that we shall address in this class. Questions, I might add, that have no answers. No complete and certainly no permanent answers. We shall fail because history 
is that unsteady ground I spoke of. It is not a rigid truth, but an ever-changing reality. If it were an ironclad actuality, then we would be able to learn from it. But all we can do is learn about its edges, insinuations, and negative spaces. Thank you. I guess we have time for some questions. <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm interested in that. I mean, initially when I started working on this project, I was, I was thinking about, you know, the relationship between uh, black horse riders and horses. Uh -oh. oh, that's my. Um, oh, sorry. There. Um, and I wasn't so much thinking about the history of black cowboys, but those are the kind of histories. Both, both the history of black jockeys and the history of black cowboys are those kind of. I think like the way that John Woman is talking about our understanding of concrete um, uh, history, that history is act actually kind of very shifty, you know, that we could understand John Wayne as the quintessential cowboy, and then all of a sudden, like, Idris Elba is the quintessential cowboy. Like, how can they, how can those contradictory spaces exist at the same time? You know, that history has the ability to become a completely different thing than what it was before. But yeah, I mean, the, that, yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm interested in that too. We, we were just in Oakland like last week and we went to the Bill Pickett rodeo um, and saw, and Bill Pickett was a, was a black cowboy. Um, I think he lived to like 1830 to like 1915, something like that. He was a really famous black cowboy and performed in rodeos and there's a rodeo that's named after him. So there's all these histories that have, you know, I mean, I guess in some ways it's like, if that history isn't something that we understand uh, widely, then does it exist? And how do things move in and out of existence? Is what I'm really interested in as like an ontological question. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Um, okay, so, so that piece, the vote of offering piece is one of a, of a series of works. Let me pull up one of a similar one. So as I answer your question, I can maybe point to, uh, thought I had one. In, oh, there we go. Okay. So this one is, this one is actually titled Disinhume. Um, and, and the way that this piece is structured is that it has three components. It has the, the text that's at the top. Uh, which is always the title of the piece. And then it has the image that's below that text, which is so far in all of them is a, is a bone. And it's a bone of one of the bones of the horse that was my great grandfather's horse that I exhumed. And then it has a text below that. That's a text that talks about the history of black jockeys, at least so far. I'm thinking about making some cowboy ones, to be honest, but, uh, um, and, and always the text that's at the top refers to some kind of ritual of burying. So the vote of offering isn't, in my mind at least, I mean, I, I totally understand and I think it's totally valid to read it as an offering to, to the bone. But the way that I was thinking about it at least is that it's about an offering to some other kind of higher power that the bones could also represent. You know what I mean? That the bone, um, could be some kind of uh, um, object of importance when exhumed from a grave, that things that are buried in a grave are things that we might think of as having the ability to transcend 
the world in which we live and understand and and go to some other world so they're like a a, a, a bridge between this world and the, and the next Yeah, for sure. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, I mean, completely, I think that it's an offering, it's an offering maybe to the horse, but maybe uh, to a higher power. Um, and then the other bridge is the bridge between myself and my great grandfather. And uh, so maybe I'd say like recently, well, about a year and a half ago, I actually bought a horse and I started training, uh, learning how to ride a horse with the intent eventually to ride my horse along the same mi migratory path that my great grandfather took from North Carolina to Philadelphia. And, and I've been thinking at the, of the horse as a, as a vehicle, not only for the journey, but as a vehicle um, that would be a bridge between uh, my knowledge of my own existence and some way of proving that I exist. Because if my great grandfather didn't do what he did, then maybe he didn't exist or I wouldn't exist. So I'm tying my existence to, to him, but using the horse as a bridge between. And, you know, and also like, I mean, I don't know if I'm answering your question. You're asking about, about the offering and who the offering is to, but I also think about the bone like if the if the if the if the work the artwork is an offering to the horse, then maybe also the bone itself could behave like an offering to I don't know some kind of deity like to God, or that we could receive divine messages through through some objects, or at least at very least that an object is necessary in order for us to prove that we exist. You know, we know we exist because we can like. This is here, this is real. I can prove it by touching it, therefore I know I exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I would say, and also pro making an offering to history, but also using an object as a stand-in for some kind of proof that history exists, you know, that, that Jimmy Winkfield exists or that my great-grandfather exists. Like, how do we know that? We need some kind of something like tangible that we can grab onto in order to try to prove our existence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is, it's, it's the bone is inside of the object. There is an actual object that is a bone in as in part of the part of the piece, but it's it's not an image. The whole thing. What you see there, uh huh, it's in there. Uh huh, uh huh. In that. <laughs> thought about that that's a that's a um so uh the question is uh the work how would i feel how, 
How do I think that my great-grandfather would feel about the work about him? Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, so my grandmother also is no longer living. Uh, the oldest living relation to him is, an, is a cousin, an aunt, really a, my dad's first cousin. Um, and she, and I live in Chicago, and she happens to also live in Chicago, so she comes and, and sees my shows and stuff like that. So maybe, because she knew him, I never met him. Um, and she was really excited about the work. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, it's and there's some way in which, like, the more, especially the more recent work, like, that's, a, that's, that's my horse. Like this series of drawings, they're all drawings of, of myself standing next to the horse because I never found that photograph and I wanted to make drawings based on that photograph. So in some ways, um, I realized after I had gotten a horse that the reason I had gotten the horse is, was in order to image, make an image of myself as him. Um, so when you ask that question, the first thing, like when you ask about how he would feel about the work, the first thing that comes to mind, because these are really recent drawings and, and I've been thinking about myself as him, is like, uh, I don't know, and to me it's, I, sometimes I have trouble separating him from me. Like sometimes I think that I am him. And the whole idea of reproducing the journey uh, from North Carolina to Philadelphia on horseback in some ways is my way of like occupying his identity. Um, so how do I, I feel great about the work, so. <laughs> That's a good question, thank you for that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And let me try to summarize it. I'm supposed to repeat the questions because you guys don't have microphones. Um, essentially, you're, you're, you're saying, uh, one, that the, the history and legacy of black people specifically, I, I guess you're saying specifically in, in America, is one that we often don't have access to. Maybe even to think about like the history of black cowboys or the history of black jockeys, and that, um, I, you know, I found information about, about him. Um, but at the same time, I do believe, I mean, some of what I'm reading is just, it's, a te it's an excerpt from this story by Walter Mosley. So that's the part that's really well written. My, my writing is like, I don't know, I feel, I feel a way about putting it next to Walter. He's pretty dope. Um, but I mean, you know, when he talks about, um, history being something that we're constantly reinventing. You know, that even, I often think about the story that my grandmother told me. And if I tell you that story again, like actually when I was reading this just now, some of the stuff that I had written, because this, 
I've rewritten and written the parts of, at least about my, gr my grandmother. I'm like, oh, actually reading it now, that's not how I remembered it earlier today, but that's how I remembered it like six months ago. And I'm interested in the way that I remembered it a year ago and five years ago. And I know that the way that I remember the story that she told me 10 years from now will be, it, it'll, it'll shift and it'll change. So I'm, I, I mean, honestly, I mean, I'm not always so interested in accuracy and the truth of stories, but I'm interested in the way that stories construct reality. And I think that, I don't know, I mean, excuse me, I'm a, I'm a hip hop fan. And one of the things I've always liked about um, hip hop is like, is embellishment, you know, like, did Jay-Z really get shot like seven times point from point black range and, and survive? Like, how did that happen? But it's a great story. I love it. You know, so I'm, I, I think that there's an ability. I think that, well, one of the things I think that is, is within the narrative void, you know, that if blackness to a certain extent has been historically excluded from participation in society as full human, fully human, that there's that could be thought of as a kind of void. Um, and I'm not such an Afro pessimist that I think that that void has nothing that can be, um, you know, like uh, taken. Like there's something that can come out of that. Hip hop is one of them, jazz. I mean, you know, the idea of DJing and scratching records as an instrument when you have when you don't have an instrument to make music out of that comes from a, from a lack of access or it comes out of a void. So I think that that kind of storytelling and thinking about identity is something that can, you know, is is even maybe even better than, you know. And my, and my mother is white, so my younger brother when he looked up the ancestry stuff, he traced my mother's line back to like King so and so and like you know the seventh century or something like that. And then on my dad's side, he traced it back to like my great grandfather. And then after that, it's like, we don't know, you know, but I'm really interested in that void and what, what, um, what can come from that, you know, what kinds of imaginative, imaginative thinking or ways of being, um, because I think that we're uh, maybe overdue for a new way of thinking about how we operate uh, in, in relation to the, the world, to the earth. Oh, yeah? Let me, put, let me write it down. Oh, shoot. I'm on it. It's in my Amazon cart. That's amazing. I'm gonna thank you for that. I'm gonna check it out for sure. Thank you so much. Scary. I mean, what, when I see those, I know, I know I'm like, can we leave? <laughs> let's not stay here. Let's go some. Let's go eat somewhere else. You know, I don't know. I, 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 at one point, I had done a little bit of research into those, and I can't remember where they came from. But they must have some relation to this history of, of black horse racing, right? Otherwise, like, because you see the black lawn, lawn jockey, but then you, there's no black people riding horses in the sport, at least not today. There was a guy who rode in the Kentucky Derby. Uh, I think it was like 2017 or 18. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
I don't know if I would call it a metaphor, but it's definitely a parallel that when I came across that story about Jimmy Winkfield's migration, I was like, oh, this, this has to go into one of the, one of the pieces. So um, in the piece, in the gallery, uh, the text that's written there is sort of a, my paraphrasing of a story about Jimmy Winkfield, who, like I said in the, in the lecture, in the text that I was reading, um, was riding in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he was super dominant in the sport, and then he was forced out. I mean, they're literally, in one of the books I read about him, there's a story about him, like all the white jockeys would, they didn't even care about winning the race. They're just like, knock Jimmy off that horse, you know? And he got knocked off horses several times, almost died. So he ends up going, uh, I think he's in Poland at the time when, um, at the beginning of World War I, it would have been around the beginning of World War I, and um, they're, they're starting to like come in, like the troops are coming in and they're bombing the area. And, and, and Jimmy and all the people who were in the stable, other horse riders, they flee. I, no, they're not in Poland, they're in Russia and they're fleeing to Poland through, no, they're fleeing to the Ukraine because they end up in Odessa. Um, and they have to go through the mountains. And I, I mean, it's a crazy story. They're like, pe like the, the people almost died because they weren't eating. They were just feeding the horses, you know? So like the guys who were driving the horses across that, across that journey. And I can't remember how, it's been a while since I've read that book, but I can't remember how long it was, but it's just this amazing story about, um, about migration. And I, yeah, like, like you said, like a metaphor or at least like a really strong parallel between you know, these two different kinds of migration and, and, and two different relationships to horses. But they got to Odessa and then they started a breeding program with those horses because those were like some serious thoroughbreds. That's why they didn't want to leave them behind. So they got to Odessa and they started this breeding program and eventually started like a racing program in Odessa. So that's the, that's, that's in the text that's in the black lower part of the pizzas in the gallery. Huh? She had her hand up first. Sorry. Yeah. Go to. Okay. You know, I, um, uh oh. Oh, there we go. I mean, it's like a, un it's, it's kind of an unconventional lecture that I gave because I didn't I talked all around the work, but didn't necessarily address the work directly. But I'm glad you guys are asking about it in the QA because then I can address the work directly. Uh, this is a piece, I don't know, this is what, probably what, like 2020, 20, this was during the pandemic, at the very beginning of the pandemic, so it was 2020 I made this piece. And it wasn't until I had been working on this project for several years that I learned that at the end, toward the end of my great-grandfather's uh, life, he attempted suicide. And I don't know that much about this, this story, only that, like, he tried to shoot himself and unsuccessfully uh, tried to kill himself. Um, but I took this sort of like hypothetical suicide letter and used it as kind of a, uh, used the bone of the horse as kind of a, um, a guide to block out certain text in that letter. So I rewrote the letter in my own handwriting. And, and when, you, when the piece opens up, you can see the text. And when the piece closes, a light comes on inside of the box, which highlights certain sections of the text. And I think that there were seven of these, and the seven of them together formed a sentence. And uh, through using multiple different versions of this, that, that, that sentence talks about, or it refers to the location of the burial of the horse. So the site at which the, the, the body of the horse was exhumed. I think that's all I want to say about that. Thank you.